Thank you for listening today on Revealing Wholeness, sponsored by Infinity Whole Health. Check out our website at infinitywholehealth.com, where we are revealing the eternal in each individual, the infinite in the individual. The creativity is made manifest. Limitation is let go. Now, here's your host, Dr. Troy Munson. Could you imagine eating kidney pie? Be like, oh, you know, just the thought of it. But that's what we did. We had sweet bread. How many of you are old enough to have sweet bread? You have, yeah. That's the thymus gland on the heart. It's the main immune quarterback. We don't eat that anymore. You know, it's it's weird that we don't. These are the highest highest density foods on the planet, and yet we just ignore them for the muscle meat. You have an animal that takes down another animal who's a carnivore. He doesn't eat the muscle meat. They eat all the organs. They'll bury the muscle meat because in case they're starving, that's the last ditch effort that they will eat. But it's the first thing that we do. So it's different. So our goal is now to try to figure out where do I get nutrient density in my, in my diet to repair these organs so that I can feel younger and younger like I did when I was 18. It's all about how we feed you and how nutrient dense your food is. It's gonna be everything to us. So I wanna finish out the men talking about the prostate. Now, in men and women we have analogous organs, meaning the testes are analogous to a woman's what? Ovaries, okay? Now isn't it interesting that women will have their ovaries out? Men, if somebody told you, I think we should cut your testicles off, what would you tell them? You'd be like, no way, I know that's bad. But women will do it without thinking about it because they're not told that, unfortunately. This gal that's still having hot flashes, she was told at age 39 that she didn't need her uterus anymore and that she should have it out. And I said, the prostate is analogous to the uterus in the women. And in the prostate, our prostate turns testosterone to a stronger form of testosterone, 10 times stronger. It's one of the, one of the main sites. The skin is the other site. If we produce too much of it, we will lose hair too. So we think, oh yeah, I would love DHT, dehydroxy testosterone, 10 times stronger than testosterone. But it actually is a detriment to you if it's too high. So we want to balance in our bodies between DHT, testosterone, and androstenedione, which is a weaker form of testosterone. So we have three types of testosterone in the male body. Women, you have three types of estrogen. And there's not one substance in your body called estrogen. It is a class of, of estrogens. And so there's one that's, that's the normal one, there's one that's weak, and there's one that's really strong. The strongest one that you make in your body, estradiol, when, you get, when women get Premarin, that they'll get in hormone replacement, pregnant mare urine, when they get Premarin, horse, horse estrogen is 100 times stronger. And women are give this, given this all the time. Unopposed estrogen to a woman's body loves to grow every cell until every cell grow with reckless abandon. When we have a cell that grows with reckless abandon, what do we call it? We call it cancer. So that's why all of a sudden they've kind of they've pulled way back from hormone replacement therapy because they realize unopposed estrogen or estrogen alone with nothing else paired with it is a bad idea, and it really is. It is actually seen as a toxin by the liver. The other hormones are said, okay, you guys need to go out. But when it sees estrogen, it's like, oh my gosh, you come out now. Because you're a growth hormone and you don't even care who you tell to grow. So when we look at a female body, we see estrogen here. And progesterone is typically 25 times as much estrogen in the female body. So if we're looking at a blood test, we're going to see, you know, picograms of, of estrogen and nanograms of of progesterone. Nanograms are a thousand times picograms. Okay, so we're going to see a lot more progesterone in the system. They're learning that too. They're saying, hey, we don't now just do birth control pill with estrogen alone. We pair them together and we make them right for woman's body to try and stop some of these things we're seeing happen. Yeah. DHEA? DHEA is the parent. So we'll see huge amounts of DHEA because DHEA, so here's how things work. How many of you have been to my cholesterol workshop? Anybody here yet? No. So cholesterol is here. DHEA. DHEA splits off and now becomes progesterone and then testosterone estrogen. 
So DHEA is going to go to pregnenolone and progesterone, but it, you can short circum that, circum that, ladies, and make pregnenolone go to cortisol immediately. So if you make cortisol really well, that's what you're doing. We call that a, a pregnenolone steal. You're stealing it because of the stress value here all the time. You're perceiving stress that a lion's chasing you, and your body's like, we don't need to procreate and make progesterone. We need to run and maybe clamp down on blood vessels when we get mauled by a lion, and we're going to bleed out until our friends get here to save us. So cortisol clamps down on blood vessels and makes sure that, you know, this is happening. Does that sound like high blood pressure? Yeah. So the more stress you're under, this is constantly happening to your blood vessels, and your, your heart's like, oh, what the heck? You know, I can't get through here. I've got to raise blood pressure to try to get blood through because there's so much cortisol. So, yes, you know, that kind of explains question. So DHEA is important, but you give too much of it, it can go right into making more stress hormones. So I've, I've read books that say, you know, they herald it as the hormone to save mankind. And while it's nice, it should never be given in large doses, and it should only be sublingual, in my opinion. It shouldn't be a cream that can release all of a sudden in huge amounts. And once you take it, the liver is immediately going to take everything from the small gut, goes right to liver first, and it, it's processing. Whoa, what the heck did you eat? It's pulling garbage out, you know? But if it sees DHEA, it's like, we'll just process this too. I don't know why this is here. And so DHEA we want to be careful with. Because if you start taking it, your body's like, well, I don't have to make this anymore. So now people, when they come to me, it's, it's hard to get them from, my cholesterol's you know, 300, I've got to do something now. I'm like, your cholesterol's 300 because you're under a lot of stress and your body's trying to make hormones. You're stealing all of it. And so your cells keep making cholesterol because it's saying, I need my hormones and you're not giving them to me. And I'm going to continue to put out cholesterol until you do. So high cholesterol does not damage the heart. High cholesterol is telling us that you're really overstressed. And so once, once we have, we'll, I'll just do this a little, little bit. So as we look at a blood panel, cholesterol, uh, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. So cholesterol, we need a lot of. It's, it's okay if it's in high quantities. That's not heart stuff, but everybody thinks it is. HDLs is carriers from the tissues to the liver to get rid of cholesterol. That's what HDL does. So that's why everybody says, oh, HDL is the good guys. That carries it from the body to the liver to get rid of the cholesterol. LDL carries from the liver to the tissues cholesterol. It's the carrier molecule. So if I see cholesterol at 300, I'm going to see LDLs following it up just as high, and that's normal. And people are freaking out. I got two numbers bad on my lipid panel. I got my LDLs high, my cholesterol is high. No, that's normal. Those are carrier molecules. That's all they are. Okay, we can, if somebody's listening to this out there and they say, he's totally wrong because there's part A and part B of LDLs, that's just confusing to us. There are good and bad LDLs. LDLs, low-density lipoproteins, there are very low-density lipoproteins which do go into tissue, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and do cause problems. But let's get to triglycerides. Triglycerides are how much sugar you're eating. And so normal values of triglycerides go all the way up to 150, and that is not true. Normal values for triglycerides are 100 and lower. So if I've got somebody, their triglycerides are, let's say, 180. I take them off all grain, all sugar for two weeks. They will be under 100 by the end of two weeks. Triglycerides drop very, very quickly. They should. If they're not, we have liver issues. So that's another way to tell if I've got liver issues. Because the body can't, can't process the fat, can't turn it into sugar fast enough. And so as triglycerides go down under 100, now I can correctly evaluate cholesterol. If we drop grains in your body, I no longer, I no longer have the tissue inside the blood vessels irritated. So let's explain why. How many of you have eaten or licked a lollipop all the way to the end without chewing it? Anybody done that? Fabulous, a couple of you. Now, how many of you have licked something like that that was very sweet and you felt your tongue becoming more and more raw? Have you all felt that? Okay, that's what sugar does to tissue. So if my triglycerides are high and I'm eating lots of bread and sugar, guess what the inside of my blood vessels look like? They feel just like my tongue all the time. So if I'm splitting 
and damaging the epithelial layer inside that blood vessel, those very d low density lipoproteins I said we get back to, they go into those cracks and they try to start filling in that crack because they're fix a flat. Okay? I am bleeding out. I've got to stop that. And so our body has this wonderful way of, of fixing bleeds. Well, why would we bleed? What's supposed to repair us when we bleed? Vitamin C. So the higher vitamin C, the more we repair. So when I start taking vitamin C, I start repairing those cracks in my blood vessel and my blood vessels start to heal. So all of you, all of us, none of us here and none of us in the sound of my voice out there have, are not descendants of an ice age survivor. Think about that. How much food available in an ice age? Not a lot of food. Now, what we would do is we would catch animals that could eat a little bit of vegetation and we'd kill them and immediately eat their organs because that's where all the vitamin C and A and everything was. You know, that's all we did to survive at that point until all of a sudden we found that there were greens growing again and got vitamin C because everything green is vitamin C. Unfortunately, though, when we would go to the store, how much of that food has been sitting there for a couple, three weeks? A lot of it. We don't even know where it came from. Maybe it took two weeks just to get there in the truck, you know, but because it was, you know, the right temperature in the truck and humidity and they got it there and when they planted it, they put MPK on it so it looked nice and green and healthy, but it really didn't have, it was devoid of all the other nutrients that we needed from the plant, but it looked good. And so we buy it because it looks pretty good. You know, these, these are the things that we have to kind of feed our body and they're just not quite enough, unfortunately. Every day that, that vegetable sat on that truck, it's denaturing 7%. In two weeks, it's just about done. There's not much left. So I saw, I've seen reports that say a head of lettuce today, or today you'd have to eat 50 heads of lettuce to equal one head of lettuce, you know, in 1930 or whatever it was. And I said, well, that's because we probably grew it locally and we ate it the day we picked it. You know, if we did that now, it, it'd be pretty good. You know, so the fresher you buy things, the better it is for us. But again, here we are, not huddled around a campfire in community, you know, scavenging and, and doing things like we should. We're now a thousand miles an hour in a thousand different directions, and we wonder why our health is, is suffering. And so now we're kind of realizing, oh man, I gotta, I've really got to de-stress and change things. And so part of that stress modification is doing some things to really unhinge you from that process. So... We now got to the thyroid. So the thyroid was a last ditch effort to try and help the body survive. And so the thyroid literally means shield. It's trying to shield the body from everything that it's under. And so when somebody finally gets a thyroid and the thyroid goes down, it's the first thing they pick on. And while I'll work with thyroid cases because we can, we can do thyroid support while we're doing hypothalamic support, while we're doing pituitary support, while we're doing adrenal support and feeding these things. That's quite okay to do. We should get some energy in the system quite quickly where, hey, you know what? I'm lowering my dosage on my thyroid medication because I'm feeling a bit amped up on it now. I said, okay, your thyroid's starting to come back online and starting to do things. Go back to your doctor, let's get some tests done. There's things that I'll do that I'll warn patients when I work on a thyroid, I said, I'm gonna have you go in for a thyroid test because your doctor said they'll do it anytime they, that you want because they're cool that way. And I said, we need a TSH. So what's TSH stand for? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Well, who tells the thyroid what to do? What organ? What, what gland we've talked about? Pituitary, master hormone gland. So the hypothalamus said, hey, pituitary, you need to make some TSH. You need to stimulate that thyroid. Oh, okay. So if I do a certain thing with, with, a, with a person with a thyroid issue, it's going to stimulate the thyroid to start responding, but the pituitary is going to watch what I'm doing and say, whoa, we got this nutrient that we really, really need a lot of. And so it immediately sends a lot of TSH to say, hey, ramp up your function like no tomorrow. And so the doctor says, whoa, your TSH is through the roof. We got to do something right now. And I tell my patient before they go, I said, now I'm expecting your TSH to go really high. No, that is no problem. We're expecting it because what we're doing, and we're seeing the right response by the pituitary to try to tell the thyroid, hey, you need to pick up this stuff because this is your job. I'm just telling you to do it a little better, a little faster. So, and I'll always ask folks, I said, before you go in, because I need you to be really strong here, how do you feel? I'm, I'm feeling a lot better. Great, 
Are you going to be freaked out if you have a really high TSH score? No, you've explained it to me. Good. Go get the blood test.